Thanks so much to coming out to Rinda Books. Um, my name is Beth Ann Gallagher. I am a bookseller here on the weekend, and I'm also a classic film and silent film blogger. I have a blog called Spellbound My Movies. And when the bookstore owner Maria said, we've been contacted by an author, and uh, her book is in your area of interest, would you be uh, interested in uh, getting involved with the event? And I said, yes, of course. <laughs> I, mean, I was very excited. Um, uh, unbeknownst to Maria, Vonda and I had already connected on Facebook. Yes, yeah, we had. Mm -hmm. This is Vonda Kraft. She's written The Man Who Made the, uh, the Movies, all about uh, William Fox, um, probably America's least remembered. Yes, I would say so. Film mogul. Film yes. mogul, yes. Right. And in my opinion, the most important one. But, we, yeah. agree. we agree. We <laughs> agree. <laughs> and then uh, through, through coincidence um, uh, with Michael Troyan, um, Michael Troyan and I are both uh, members of TCM Backlot. That's Turner Classic Movies Fan Club. And we're members of the same local chapter. And I knew that he had a book come out on 20th Century Fox, which is what William Fox's studio eventually evolved into through a series of acquisitions. Mm -hmm. um, and Michael's book just uh, came out in the last year as well. And then we also have Jeffrey Paul Thompson, and he's an archivist for Fox. He's a co one of the two other co-authors on their book, 20th Century Fox, A Century of uh, Entertainment. Entertainment. <laughs> I was going to say movies really for a song, but I was going to say and, um, and, and so they've worked together, um, uh, putting together a book that was a little hard to do at first for the, for the earlier years it of was. the studio. Although it was interesting because later on it got difficult just where there had been a William Fox or a Daryl Zanuck, there were then 50 people running, so it was breaking it all down, yeah. you know, figuring who exactly got Die Hard made or who got mm -hmm. Star Wars made or, you know, yes. in the good old days when it was a Fox or a Zanuck. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, as you can see, we're already kind of starting to get going. The authors have uh, planned a discussion um, since uh, their uh, areas of expertise uh, it, it interconnect and interrelate to each other. Um, so without much ado, I'll let them get going. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. <laughs> and definitely we want this to be interactive, so please raise your hands if you have questions. But yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I am so impressed with your book because <laughs> I had to deal with 15 years of thoughts <laughs> at the head of the studio and you guys stood 100 years. <laughs> what inspired you to do it? And can you tell me a bit about the process? Because sure. I would love to hear that. Oh, sure. Well, I had d done a book on MGM, MGM Hollywood's Greatest Backlot, which was, we, we wanted for posterity, Jeff and I both being archivists, I wanted for posterity to have a document of MGM's history in terms of its lot. And, and, yeah, and it, because MGM at one time was the biggest of all the God, studios in the world, really, it had six lots at one period all over Culver City. So I thought, let's do a book that has the photos and the history that traces all the buildings, the backlot, all of it. So I took that book, thought, well, I'll take this over to Fox, because I, I had worked down there. I'd worked at Disney and then Warner Brothers, and a friend of mine from Warner Brothers was at Fox, uh, Jean, uh, and she got me on the lot, and she said, well, if any place on Fox is going to be friendly toward a book uh, about Fox, it's going to be the archives. So that's when I went to the archives and got to meet Jeff and his, his boss at that time. But the idea was, I thought, it's five years out to Fox being 100 years old. And I thought, what better to celebrate a hundredth anniversary, you know, a hundredth anniversary and do a book? And I thought, boy, that seems pretty easy and an easy thing to pitch. And we, we went into the archives, and it seemed easy, which I guess that always happened. And because the archives obviously was very friendly, and I, I met Jeff right off the bat, and he was supportive. And then they started the process to try and get approved, mostly so we could use the photos, because we thought you can't possibly do a book on a hundred years of Fox without using their. Archive. I mean, they're just there are collectors out there, there are photos out there, but we just thought no, and and and, and you know, be able to use the quality and thinking of all the treasures that Jeff was teasing me about. We knew they had, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. I thought let's let's. So I, it ended up being because it was taking them a while. I just on faith started the book, figuring I need the five years. I can't wait five years <laughs> and then have them say yes and then have to do another five years. So I just started on faith that during this five years, we're I'm writing it that Fox is going to come wow. on board. Wow. And, and then I just had to faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then yeah. I, Jeff internally as the Fox archivist, you know, mm -hmm. once it was official, I was pulling all the photos and stuff, but initially, 
being my my conduit to say, okay, it just it, the emails are going around, or you know. Well, and it, it was just a little bit of a backstory about the Fox Archives because I think that's part of why this book happened when it did. Is um, Fox is one of the few studios that still has an archive. Uh, most of the studios have either donated. Uh, their collections to like the Academy or USC or UCLA, or they uh, horror horrors they they dump them, <laughs> or um, and the story of the Fox Photo Archive uh, for for years the you know the the pictures that were, are in the book were taken by um, Fox photographers that that were on contract they'd go around taking pictures on the set part of the publicity team, and all those photographs were um, they were stored in Building 88 which is the administration building. And they were stored in the basement there. And if uh, you're familiar with Hollywood history, remember kind of in the, the early 70s, there was this, it was an era where they, they just started cleaning house. MGM had a famous garage sale where they just kind of opened the, the studio's wardrobe department and you could buy Gone with the Wind costumes for five bucks and, you know, it, uh, photos. And they just, they just kind of, you know, but at, at that time there was no... Um, there was no secondary market. You got to remember, this is before the VCR, <laughs> and the you know movies would be shown theatrically, and then they'd run on TV. And you you know you need a picture of of Rhett and Scarlet, you throw in TV Guide, and that would that would be sufficient. Well, and the same thing was happening at you know Fox, where uh, they were they started cleaning house, and um, down in the basement of the, the administration building where all the old photographs were stuck. Uh, they decide, well, you know, let's just, we, we, we need to clean out this space, and why don't we just sell it to a Hollywood, you know, Boulevard souvenir shop, and if we ever need anything, we can, we can just run down there and get it, you know, it's not, not a big deal. And luckily there was a guy, um, Frank, what was his last name? Uh, uh, anyway, Frank, uh, was, head of the, was head, of the, head of the publicity department, and he really fought, um, I was able to talk to him, um, well, you know, about it, and he's, I don't even know if he's still alive, but eight years ago, he was, I think, in his 80s or 90s. But uh, he, he felt very strongly. This was, this was, you know, this was, we're talking about Shirley Temple and Marilyn Monroe and, you know, Rogers and Hammerstein musicals. I mean, this was kind of the, the golden era. The golden era. Mm -hmm. And it was the image of Fox. You know, these were, these were the images. This was corporate, what we call, you know, corporate image. And so he really went to battle and he said, no, I think we need to keep them. And, uh, and, and he said, you know, one, we, we really use them in our international television distribution. And so he convinced the powers to be, okay, that's fine. But let's, so they, they, they kind of packed them all up and they shipped them uh, up to UCLA. And uh, they sat there in the arts theater, uh, theater arts library. And they were accessible. People could go up and do research and stuff. Um, and they just sat there from the early 1970s and uh, up until the 1990s. And... Um, Back to technology history, <laughs> the the and it, it it just happens to be a little little coincidental, but in the 1990s we had this thing called the DVD that was introduced, 1996 97, and if you remember VHS tapes, um, usually you had a photo on the front and maybe two on the back and maybe one on the side, so maybe three or four photos, if you if you have your original Star Wars uh, uh, video cassette, <laughs> um, but there started to be. The, in the 1990s, there, there, there started, and part of it, I think, was with American Classic, AMC, American Movie mm -hmm. Classics, and TCM, mm -hmm. uh, really a renaissance and an interest in old film. And uh, it was at that time that uh, Fox decided to repatriate their, their photographs back to the studio. But they had a contract with UCLA, and uh, so as, as they requested things, slowly they'd bring them back. But the, the, the majority, so we established the archive in 1996, and uh, but ev everything did not come back. We got about 6,500 boxes back in the fall of 2003. Uh, it was a lot of stuff. Um, and I photos would you say that was altogether? We guesstimate. Um, I, I guesstimated there were probably eight million unique images. Wow. Probably upwards of 25 million. We're talking about you know you unique images, and then you'd have multiples like, like a print, a negative, and two or three prints or something. So probably there were probably about 25 million items in the collection. Totally a guesstimate. Yeah. Um, but we uh, we brought everything, and I started um, in 2005. 
So my career at Fox uh, was going through boxes <laughs> that had not been touched in many cases mm -hmm. since the 1930s, 1920s. Like wow. they had taken these photos, mm -hmm. they had, you know, they used them for publicity in 1935, and then it got stuck in a box in the basement of the Building 88. That box got shipped over to UCLA. Probably was never touched because they weren't really well cataloged up there. And then they got shipped back and. Um, that was so fun. I, I, I mean, <laughs> for, for, for movie people, um, I, I, it was just, it was a dream job. Um, uh, it was just, it was, it was just, you know, you're just going through stuff. And, and I think what, I'll, I'll share one really fun experience. We worked on a, um, a big uh, John Ford at Fox box set. I don't know if anybody's mm -hmm. seen that. Yeah. It's, it was, yeah, it's we call it the golden age of home, pre, pre the, mm -hmm. the recession, pre 2008 was the golden era of home entertainment mm -hmm. because they were spending money mm -hmm. because people were buying things. <laughs> uh, <laughs> after that, it, people weren't buying things anymore. Mm -hmm. But um, we did this beautiful, beautiful Ford at Fox set and uh, I had one of the researchers come in and she, um, she was, you know, I pulled these boxes and it was just funny because we, I had my office, you know, kind of on one area and we had to kind of, you know, be working and we had the, the, the research area just, you know, 10, 15 feet away. And she was in there and I, she was just, you know, glees of, of joy where, you know, she just, just screaming how I, she was so excited about what she was finding. And I came out, I'm like, what's going on? And she said, she goes, I have been to every archive in Los Angeles and I have never seen any of these. You know, I've, I've been researching John Ford for a year now. And I said, well, that's not really surprising because these these have been hidden for sixty years, mm -hmm. you know. And these there's there's just no they no one's had access to them. And so it's really it, and I was like, so and I was that was really exciting because you know we get to make I get to see all this cool stuff. But that's the great thing about the, the DVDs and box sets mm -hmm. is that we we could share that with with uh, with movie fans. And so when I when I was doing DVD, I would Home Entertainment worked very closely with the archive to add the value added material, the, the galleries and the documentaries. And so I always made sure, so if you buy a pre-2008 DVD, um, I always tried to put as much unique, interesting material as we could on there because that was the way we people they were being yeah. published. Mm -hmm. And uh, so unfortunately, Blu-rays now, they just kind of take that content and just dump it on the next one. So it's not usually nothing new, but... Um, but that leads us to when Mike uh, did the MGM book and they, they stopped in and talked to us. And I was very excited because... I, I can like, see Jeff in the corner when I was talking to his boss. It's like, <laughs> you could feel the interest. Like, well, I, I, I perked up because <laughs> as an archivist, we always get questions about the history and, and, then, and there's a lot, there's so much mis, misinformation mm -hmm. out there. And, you know, especially about the studio lot, you know, it'd be like... Mm -hmm. They'd be, oh well, this was the building Shirley Temple was in. You're like, oh no, it wasn't. You know, and, <laughs> and how many buildings Marilyn Monroe? Oh, Marilyn, Marilyn was, was was in every building. You know, <laughs> HR had developed this really really bad tour that they give to new employees, and it was just full full of bad bad information, just made up stuff. And so when Mike came in, I I was very I was very excited because I thought this is a great idea. This is something we need as a as a company, and of course. It got turned down the first time, and um, and the second, time. and then the second time. <laughs> yeah. But luckily, when in big corporate cultures, there's a lot of turnover, and so right. new people don't know the back history. But as <laughs> and I did, and uh, so we finally got him in touch with the consumer products division, and uh, not the licensing division. We were just talking to Vonda how she had problems contacting Fox, and I was like, well, you talked to the wrong, you know, you talk to the left hand, and the right hand does something else, and. Yeah. And we got them in touch with the, our consumer products, and they were they were actually very interested. Mm -hmm. Fox, the funny thing is, when when Mike first approached us, so Fox was started in 1915. Yes. The merger took place, so it was originally Fox Film Corporation. 20th Century Pictures was a small startup. Mm -hmm. They merged, and that's how you got 20th Century Dash Fox. Just, yes, that's, and they merged because of the tragic fall. Tragic of fall of William, William Fox. Fox. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, which is it. Which is a bit big, I, I mean, all yeah. in this book, right? Yeah, it's a <laughs> big and, and story. Yeah. Big story. Yeah. And so yeah. we had, um, they were celebrating their 75th anniversary in 2010. And we were kind of like, why are you celebrating the 75th when the 100th's five? Isn't 100 years yeah. a lot cooler than 75? But that's so typical. It's so they, typical. You know, what, they seem to consider, that was my perspective, is that they seem to consider the studio really started in 35 and yeah. there really wasn't any. And they kind of erase. And Fox. they kind of told us that. Right. It's like, well, when but it was this, becoming an official book, they said, 
well, aren't you just going to start in 35? Like, <laughs> Did they say no. that to you? Well, so, I mean, sort of, it wasn't yeah. like we going to, but there was the question. There was, a, there was, the there was a weird, stage. well, because they were talking about, well, we just celebrated our 75th, so it's going to look weird if we <laughs> celebrate our 100th in five years. What we just, <laughs> in, so it'd be our 80th, because we just did this, because they did a whole, in the 75th yeah. anniversary, they did a whole media campaign, oh, a box yeah, set, yeah. and they did these, hmm. you know, kind of illustrate, you know, 75 years with the searchlight and everything. Yeah, and that was the year I came onto the lot to pitch. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. It's saying they're 75, and I'm saying in five years you're 100. So I thought, uh oh, first yeah. problem, you know. Yeah. So, so there but, were but issues. Bear in mind that that lot was there that in was 1923. The right, yeah, right. It was. Got it, it didn't get going until, until 26, uh, 26, 26, 28. Yeah. Because it was a bean field, and the farmer had a contract, I think, till. You know, to keep to growing, the, right? Yeah. To keep growing his beans, and so they had to wait for that to to expire, come out. But it was a it was a hundred, and this is something else that's been misreported. You sometimes see, oh, it's a hundred acres, it's three hundred acres. It was a hundred acres, a little less. The original lot was hundred acres, right? Uh, right. And, and it eventually grew to three hundred. The I don't think so. With I the back think lot. It, with the back lot. The back lot being where the the other two sections that were bought in the in the the. 30s and 40s. Oh, okay. Those. Yeah, so those the original tract was 100 acres. And mm -hmm. right. It's really prime, it's prime big. real estate, and he paid $300,000 for it. And, and a couple of years later, it was worth 10 times that much. So wow. even, yeah. Even. It was a really brilliant. Mm -hmm. And the original choice, tract, yeah. mo the most. Uh, do we have any Angelinos, Los Angeles, or familiar down there? Familiar. Yeah. Um, the so the Century place. City Mall, yeah. uh, which just went through mm -hmm. another redux this year. Um, that that tract where between exactly. Avenue of the Stars, mm -hmm. Santa Monica Avenue of the Stars, and Century Park West, that was part of the original. That was the original tract, mm -hmm. and so that was the original yeah. hundred acres. And now, yeah, and that's come up, and that's why in the '60s, right. because even even yeah. even after mm -hmm. forty years later, after the purchase, mm -hmm. West LA real estate had gone up and. You know, it's just going up. Well, yeah. And you know, one of the things we're telling thoughts in terms of no, we need to include this 15 years is I said, how it may be the only lot that was designed that Fox, William Fox, yes. had a lot to do with the design. The original of creator that lot. was mm -hmm. the. And see, there aren't too many lots. I mean, MGM, a lot of the other studios they bought or merged with, but William Fox actually, you know. Because his wife, Mrs. Mrs. Fox, Fox and they were very involved in. She like the right, theaters in the choiring, the, choiring. Yeah, yeah. and the design. The furnishings, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and the, the but but he but one of the few I think I think it is the only lot that was that was designed created by the filmmaker himself mm -hmm. and retained his name. You know, a hundred years on. Yes, I don't yeah. think because the Warner Brothers was originally not properly. He hasn't been properly celebrated, so it was really hard to find. Information. Good information. I mean, we yeah. even found yeah. that at Fox there wasn't a lot because once he was, once you know, was honestly gone, gone, the company kind of likes forgot you know, about him. Forgot about him, and, and I think material. that was that had to do with the way that they, he was pushed out. Yeah, that um, he was pushed out in 1930, in April 1930, and it was sort of a. It, I think it was a conspiracy to get mm -hmm. him out, I and agree. It, but his company's Fox Film Studio. And Fox theaters were at the height of their prosperity, mm -hmm. and that was true even into 1930 after the stock market crash. But these predatory figures wanted these very profitable enterprises, mm -hmm. so they they forced him out. Basically, they said, if you don't give us control or give control to the person that we appoint, we'll ruin the companies. We'll file file receivership lawsuits. We'll ruin them. And. Mm. He loved these companies. You know, the, his name was on them. He started them. He was very involved in running them, in, and in running every aspect of them. So, if you push out the guy who has built them from nothing, and built them into this incredibly successful business, you better forget about him. Like, how are you going to explain why, why, why he's not? This? Why, why yeah. he's not there? <laughs> right, yeah. and you're not really going to want to celebrate him. So. That was a problem that I ran into. Those boxes of documents that were at UCLA first, there was just nothing that was interesting. There's nothing. Yeah, there's you know an extras contract or something mm -hmm. here and there, but next, really nothing. Where, where did you go? I'm not, this is the first time I met Vonda, so this is because all the time I worked at Fox, I was always like, somebody needs to write the new a new biography of Fox, and I thought mm -hmm. someday I might get ambitious. So I'm really oh, really happy okay. she yeah. did it. <laughs> so it's, but yeah. so it's it's interesting yeah. to me because we we didn't we we had maybe. 
three or four photographs of him, and just and you talk yeah, about him yeah. being ousted, like his the rec record of him at the studio is almost non-existent. I mean, he yeah, there's there's really not a lot. So I'm interested, like where where did you go for your sources? Because that that's really okay, interesting. Yeah. I hope this doesn't bore you, but if, if you can well, say the so. inspiration for me to, to write the book was that I was very good friends with William Fox's niece, Angela oh. Fox Dunn, and she was the daughter of his youngest sister. And while her family lived in Los Angeles and William Fox always remained in New York, he would come out to L.A. for a couple of months every winter or so. And so she and her mother would visit with him because he supported everybody. And so you had to go and, you know, be really nice to him and, <laughs> <laughs> and make sure that the bills would get paid. Um, and he really paid for everything. I mean, I remember Angela telling me, she, you know, she said she really didn't know how to deal with the world because... Um, at, they were so protected by the money. She said, when the windows got dirty in the house, we moved. That's it, definitely it, top 1%, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it also shows, if you can't cope with the world, you had better, you better stay in the good graces of the person who's paying the bills. Yeah, I think so. So, <laughs> so she knew him, and she had these great stories about him, and I just always assumed, well, some, he's such a a legendary figure or his name is so famous somebody must have written a biography of him and then I looked and I saw nobody had and so then I decided I, I think having known Angela I felt that I could understand who William Fox was and one of the things that was interesting was when I would read his statements or his testimony in a lawsuit and the voice she was so profoundly influenced by him that she had the same voice, you know, she really picked that up. So wow. she was so... The, just like her cadence and that you just exactly. kind of... Like, oh, interesting. Yeah, and the way that she told a story was just the way that he would tell a story. Interesting. So she, it, and it was the fate of him and his empire really um, left this cloud of tragedy over the family that remained, you know, 50 years after he died. Wow. And so it was really intriguing to me. I really thought... What happened here? You know, how do I understand this? And that really was what pulled me into doing the story. And then, as I got into it, I realized, and I did the research, um, I realized he's really the most important of those early studio mm -hmm. founders. He made the, the broadest contributions to the industry, and he's been forgotten. He's mm -hmm. been really, if you, most film history, just slight mentions, mm -hmm. and very often in a negative cast, mm -hmm. at which... I think is really the propaganda of the subsequent regime, um, or s somebody sort of just misinterpreting um, and you know, the facts. A good example of that that I like to talk about, and I actually worked at Warner Brothers, so I'm striking my own alma mater, but it's, it's, a, good, it's a good point. Mm -hmm. Because Warner Brothers, particularly if you watch TCM, all the time you see those old ads, the creator of talking pictures, Warner yeah, Brothers, rah, yeah. rah, rah. But you know what? That's the Cause, system cause they what, developed. Because what, what's, what's, what's the first talking picture, everybody? Jazz, Jazz, right? Yeah. Okay. okay. Which is true, but yeah, not true. sound on film, mm -hmm. which is what we have now, mm -hmm. which was... Which was William Fox. gentleman. Right. Um, mm -hmm. The Warner Brothers were developing Vitaphone, which is what they used for, for um, the jazz singer, and it was a record playing along with... The Syn film, synced, up, synced up to the mm -hmm. film. So What Singing in the Rain makes fun of. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So, so you'd project the film, and you'd have a record going on the side... And that, that was the sound. How ridiculous right. is that? And, and, what, but, oh, go ahead. And, and, and Fox was offered Western Electric's manufacturing the equipment, and they hated the Warner Brothers. They really thought that they were a bunch of sort of bumpkins, crass course bumpkins, <laughs> and they, they thought they were dumb, and they didn't know what they were doing, and they really wanted to replace them, so they wanted Fox to step in and take it over. And he said, no, that will never work, you know, it, because he had been an exhibitor, and he knew the kind of people who are the projectionists who work in the theaters, and he knew the records are going to get separated from the film, there's going to be, you know, all kinds Breakage of technical... And, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. right, 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 right. And P.S., once you've made the film, you can't edit it. And that was another thing that went on in the theaters. If there was a damaged portion of film, they clip it out. If you do that, you lose your synchronization. It's no longer any good. So he said the only thing that will work is sound on film. And initially he put his own money into developing it, and then he persuaded Western Electric to adapt the machinery to use sound on film. And then, of course, the jazz singer comes along in the fall of 1927, and that creates a big sensation. That's true. Mm -hmm. But 
the other, the other major studios still dragged their feet. They really didn't want to go in that direction. Um, and, but when they made the commitment in the spring of 1928, what did they go with? They went with Sound on Fox film. Movie tone sound on film. And mm -hmm. That's what we used well, until the death of film. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> until 2014, yeah. uh, that's that's what was used. You know, so but nobody really gave him credit for that. No. Yeah. And I thought it was very characteristic of him is is where just as you say, the Warner Brothers were kind of like, we just need to figure out some kind of technology to save ourselves because they were in real desperate financial shape. Where William Fox very carefully invested the money and thought it ahead that, yeah. and had a sound lab on the lot, I know at least at the Western Avenue studio, mm -hmm. where everyone else was like, I mean, even MGM that was considered the biggest and best studio didn't want anything to do with it. I mean, they just couldn't see that ahead at all. So yeah. that William Fox was, was always that far ahead in his thinking, um, you know, and yeah. that he and, took and the time. He, it was the first studio to say we're completely abandoning silent yeah. films, yeah. and that was in like early 1929, mm -hmm. and nobody wanted to do that. Right. Yeah, It was like, well, can't we go slowly, you know, can we, can't we just sort of slowly transition, and then he was just, this is the future, we better, mm -hmm. it, okay, it's going to be an adjustment, a big adjustment, let's get it over with, you know, and because this is where we're going. The, the, and it's funny because, you know, the movie industry has always resisted change yeah. because it interrupts yep. the the flow of the money, right. you know. Right. And every time, you know, with with sound on film, that's gonna wait, wait, wait. We'll have to we'll have to invest in in speakers, and we'll have to you know re refit our theaters. And then when mm. when 20th Century Fox and you know when widescreen came along, right? Yeah. We don't think of that anymore. But Seems up until the early 50s, it was kind of what your well the old TV sets, and we can't even say the TV screens. <laughs> right. um, but the 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 one one point one three three ratio, uh, you know, when they widescreen, oh, don't do that, we, and we can't do stereophonic sound because that's going to cost us more money. And they've always been resistant to change because that really really interrupts yeah. the, the yeah. flow of money, you know. And 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 I, the, it's just funny. That it goes yeah. back right back to 1927, right. 28. Right, and and all with Fox and Grandeur. Again, right. yeah. his his foresight. Television. What the first commercial broadcast of TV took place? What like twenty nine or something like that, or yeah. in that late late twenties? Yeah. yeah, it did late late twenties. And Fox, like, and it was very crude, and you know, and most people thought, oh, that won't go anywhere. And how do you make money from it? All kinds of issues. And Fox thought, and he thought, this is potentially going to wipe us out. This is going to, because why are you going to go to a theater? He knew that that mm -hmm. technology would be improved and perfected at some point. He knew um, we're looking at it and it's very early stages, but it's going to be refined and it's gonna get there and then it's gonna hit us hard. What do we do to fight back? And his thought was you do spectacular movies, you do widescreen. So he developed 70 millimeter grandeur. And again, as you're saying, Jeff, you know, a lot of resistance, especially, well, oh, we're just figuring out how to work with sound. We don't wanna do this. But again, his foresight yeah. that, and in fact, in the 50s, what, you know, then the World War comes along and it. Everything it, gets halted. Yeah, yeah. everything gets halted. But, and, but then after the war ends, television starts to take off and it decimated for a while yeah. film revenues. And what brings people back into the theaters? Cinemascope, right? Right. Which is, which is yeah. So he was absolutely right about that. And just, just to clear, so Fox Grandeur was, it was, so Cinemascope, which is widescreen, we're talking about, came along, introduced 1953 by 20th Century Fox. Mm -hmm. But what she was, Fox Grandeur was the, the same, was a 70 millimeter process, mm -hmm. was introduced in 1929 by Fox. Wow. And um, there, there's a gorgeous, the United Artists Theater down in, uh, in downtown Los Angeles, down on Ninth Street, which just reopened uh, after, it'd been a, the, uh, the theater itself had been a church for about three decades. But Ace Hotel bought it, renovated. Now it's this, you know, uber hip, you know, mm -hmm. hipster place for millennials. Um, but they reopened the theater, and the Fox Grandeur screen was still there. They ripped, they just ripped it out like oh, four years ago. No. I was like, it lasted that long. <laughs> but the original Fox Grandeur screen was still wow. there, and it was. But it was so twenty, twenty-five, almost twenty-five years before, quarter century before. Mm -hmm. Most of the world ever knew about a widescreen mm -hmm. uh, yeah. screen. Yeah. Fox had done it again, very, very innovative and very, very ahead of his time. You know, I mean, yeah. just, yeah. I mean, just, just to get that, you know, because, you know, just very, very uh, uh, ahead of his time. Right, so. right. And, and that's right. one of the things. Matter of fact, in the book, we 
point out is when you think of the great traditions that the companies had, how many of them go back to William Fox and the technologies he developed so that when they did, you know, uh, CinemaScope, 20th Century Fox did, now we've kind of got James Cameron has always brought with each of his films some technology, the, the 3D, you know, and that. So it's, 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 it, it was, it was fun for us and constantly inspiring for mm -hmm. me, you know, writing mm -hmm. that having a founder like that. And again, yeah. I mean, literally, because I'd come across either nothing or negative things about him, when we were thinking of how to title that section of the book, I thought, I want to go so far the other direction from all this negative stuff I've heard mm -hmm. that we came up with the fantastic Mr. Fox. <laughs> I thought, no, that, plus, we were also but thinking... We, we stole that from a movie. Right, yeah. I also, yeah. to show you what kind of boss I was, I couldn't just have a title. I said, for every title in the book, every chapter title, it's got to be a Fox movie that matches what we're talking uh -huh. about. So sometimes they really didn't like that. But, I, but, but that worked because Fox made the, the animated film, The Fantastic Mr. Fox. So that worked. And it was, somebody would come up with that and be like, oh, that's perfect. But, but it was also perfect because he was fantastic. Yeah, okay, but how did, you, how did you know that the negative information was not correct? How did you well, because usually it was, it, it, with, with a lot of research, it's usually the, the people who only went, and there are a lot of these because they can do a quick book and make some quick money, do just like the first level of research. Or, I don't know, if, a, a lot of times those things didn't even have sources. But it was usually when you'd go and then say, well, there's got to be other books, like the, what is it, How the Jews Created Hollywood? That's oh, the Neil Gabler book. book. Yeah. yeah. See, now that gave me at least a own. taste yeah. Yeah, right. of, of, yeah, there's more here, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and, and obviously, please tell us, because, you know, I'd like to know too, like, mm -hmm. with the in-depth research you did, how... You know, how did I? Yeah, where did you find the, the most information? Uh, I would say it was really very, very widely scattered, and f mm. you know, I ran into that first roadblock of there's really nothing at the studio, um, right. and so then I thought, okay, how am I gonna how am I gonna do this? And I thought, well, where else would it be? One of the key sources was um, Upton Sinclair. The, you know, that, okay. Did you track down his? So, so Upton yeah. Sinclair, well, you, you tell okay. Upton Sinclair, because okay. this is fascinating, because okay. we did have this biography on our shelf. And, okay. And I started, so they had that. Yeah, and I, I, read, yeah. I read that, so. It, okay. Uh, you know, after Fox got tossed, thrown out of his companies in April 1930, he really believed they were going to let him have a hand in running the companies. And, of course, get out of here, don't, you know, we don't want to hear from you, we don't, and he kept coming back, I can save the companies, no, get out of here. <laughs> Just, they went off a cliff. Anyway, he was really, really heartbroken about that, and uh, it, he, it was very difficult for him to accept. So his wife, Eva, said, why don't you write a book about it? And I think what she was thinking was, you know, you'll get it out of your system. <laughs> I would have to listen to it. Um, <laughs> and so he hired Upton Sinclair. Um, and he offered him, what was it like $25,000, you know, which was before about $400,000 equivalent today. today. He, so he shows up at his house in Pasadena, and Upton Sinclair was writing a novel, and no, I don't really want to do that. Um, you know, I've I got this novel, and the wife says, Upton, you know, because they were, they were in financial trouble. She said, think of all the trouble you go to when you're writing one of your books, and a multimillionaire knocks on the door, and <laughs> she, said, Upton, she went to Fox and said, Upton, we'll write you. <laughs> Good Mrs. Sinclair, she's like, <laughs> well, that's, great. that's a great story. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so Fox went and poured his heart out to Sinclair, but Sinclair really didn't want to do it. I mean, it's, it, it's an okay book, you know, it's mm -hmm. got a bunch of facts, I don't think he's wrong, but he did no independent research, he just relied on everything Fox told him, and you can tell he distances it it's kind of a P, it's a PR campaign. I mean, really, because yeah. I think it, how long is it? Three hundred pages. It's about that, yeah. And the first what fifty pages cover his life for the first fifty years, yeah. and then the rest two hundred fifty pages is kind of a defense. Well, I'm not a crook, you know. I mean, right? Yeah. Is it kind of how you? Or, well, it's more like my companies were stolen from me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, just kind of yeah. a, a very self-promotional. Right, right. And I mean, and I think he was just really in this very traumatized state yeah. and oh, just sure. really trying to work out his emotions but Sinclair wasn't Sinclair just sort of took it verbatim and you know here it is folks make of it what you will this is all what Fox told me I don't stand behind it, it, it it's, it's very yeah. it's a very I mean kind of an odd position for the I mean for a, a well-known writer to yeah. kind of put themselves 
it's almost like ghost writing but yeah his name's on and yeah it's, it's, it's a it, it's yeah. it's an interest and that's the only yeah. biography really until yeah. that what 1969 biography right the, what the Glenn and all of that but at any rate to, yeah. to, just to finish to, off yeah, this, yeah. the Sinclair story so you know the book is uh, so so um but Upton Sinclair saved the transcript because they had two stenographers. You know, Fox was talking Ooh. so fast they had to hire a second one. So the, the, there's a 700 page transcript, which is at Lilly Library in Indiana. Now, but it's not filed in the place where you would think it would be filed. <laughs> so I think, Sounds you know, funny. if people went and thought, well, maybe there's something there. They in would the Upton look Sinclair it. papers, they're not, it's not there? Well, it is, but, it, but they, they have a huge Upton Sinclair collection. And you would think it would be in this one box, but it's over in the other box. And oh. so somehow I found it over there. And so that that had a lot of really good information. It had a lot of a lot more personal information that Sinclair didn't use. I bet. Yeah. So yeah. So so that was um, that was I would say the single most important source. But it was not even the major source because you know it was one source. Then I looked through all the trades because I figured, well, you know, at a certain point in his career, he's looking for publicity, right. you know, when he's starting off. So, and this was before they were digitized, so mm. they went oh. through microfilm reviews, mm. every issue. Wow. If you just waited trades. 10 years, it would have been all on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so wow. that was, and, and then I thought, okay, well, where else, you know, he interacted with a lot of famous people. And they kept their records, or they would do an oral history. So I would think, okay, who's you know, who else did he, you know, who else might have spoken about him? So I would go to this archive and that archive and the other you know collection, anybody that he might have written a letter to, or. And did you had, find? Did you find a lot? I did. did I you? found. Yeah, I did. And another great source, which I would not have anticipated, were legal records. Oh. He loved to the sue lawsuits. people, <laughs> and people loved to sue him. <laughs> and, and this was interesting. I initially thought it's going to be really dry legal information, but in the depositions they would say, "Well, how did you meet so and so?" And and then and then you would also get the unvarnished opinions. Whereas in a press release, so and so is the greatest, et cetera, et cetera. And then you'd get what they really thought of. <laughs> <laughs> and so there was, you know, good information there. Oh, go, go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, go I, ahead. Do you want to talk about the Edison case? Because the, the, oh, yeah. this is, I mean, yeah, again, talk, talk, talk about research. like somebody who, who changed the history of Hollywood. I mean, that it, it basically made Hollywood possible. But yeah, talk about yeah. the Edison case. Well, okay. So in the early 1900s, Thomas Edison had, um, a, well, he held a lot of the patents that had to do with the motion picture camera and consequently the projector. Mm -hmm. And he really believed he invented the motion picture industry because he invented these, machine, these machines and that's what you needed to make mm -hmm. it. So he, there were all kinds of patent wars in the, between 19, uh, 1900 and 1908. And finally that resolved into, there was a company called the Motion Picture Patents Company and with Edison at the head, uh, and, and what they they took the position that if you want to make a motion picture, you have to get licensed by us. Mm -hmm. If you want to show a motion picture, you also have to get licensed by us, and you oh. have to pay us. Mm -hmm. And there were ten licensed manufacturers, and uh, nobody else could legally make a, a movie. So they started off monopolizing production, and they did a pretty good job of that. And then they moved into distribution, mm -hmm. and they were eventually going to go into exhibition so that they would control the entire industry. When they moved into distribution, their movies used to be distributed through local agencies that were called rental agencies. There were 120 of them in the mid-decade there, and by, what, 1911 or so, there was one left because they had either driven them out of business or they bought them up. You know, basically going and saying, we'll ruin your business if you don't sell to us. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, these were mostly Called the mafia, small time. Right? <laughs> 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 sort of. And, and it was sad because these were small time entrepreneurs, you know, mm -hmm. and this was their dream, but they knew they were up against a force that they could not overcome. William Fox, with his Greater New York rental, Film Rental Company in New York, said, I don't want to sell. I like my business, and you're not going to push me out of business. And th he sort of trapped them into, so that they showed that th they were really coercing him to, to sell, that it was not voluntary. Anyway, upshot being he sued them, 
and then he went to Washington with his lawyer to the Justice Department and persuaded them to file an antitrust, antitrust lawsuit. Yeah. And, and he's never gotten credit for that. No. Um, I thought you mentioned yeah. Carl Lemley, what the, the universal things. I mentioned, oh, Lemley with his imp, and then he, he went up against him. He's right. the reason the studio system exists. It's like, yeah. no, no, how come no. nobody talks about William Fox? If Fox? He's the one who sued if, Edison. Can if you Fox, imagine? If Fox had yeah. done that, it would, I mean, Edison, I mean, there, there wouldn't have right. been any. No. Right. Uh, and, and what Carl Lemley was doing at Universal, imp and then Universal, was he was just saying, I don't care about that. I don't care about the right. company's claims. He was just flouting their claims, but legally they were still mm -hmm. entitled. So, you know, would they have set up a studio system? I doubt it. You know, yeah. you just had these sort of renegade filmmakers who were trying to expand their share of the market. Fox said it's got to be legally dismantled. And that's what did it, that law, that antitrust lawsuit. And he poured a lot of money, his own money into it because the Justice Department was really a fledgling department at that point. Mm -hmm. And they, they didn't really have much of a budget. And so he helped finance that. And I found in one article in the trades where the patents company lawyer stood up and said, this case is not the United States against you know the patents company. This is William Fox against the patents company. I know his, lawyer, <laughs> his lawyer has been sitting next to the government lawyer throughout the entire wow. trial, advising him, telling him what to do, because they didn't know how to do this work. So yeah, so when that's dismantled, in, that decision came down in 1915, um, and that really set the stage for the studio system. Then people could make movies freely without mm -hmm. being without. beholden to the patents company. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. any. So that was a really, really important decision. But and he, you know, he took credit for it at the time, but I think he was sort of, he didn't really talk too much about his own role because I think he wanted, he didn't want to diminish what the government had done, you know. So he let them take the credit for it, but he was really behind the scenes. Yeah. Really. Instigating it and engineering it and paying for it too. Paying for you know? it now. Yeah. So, yeah. So that was a really major, major contribution. It's, it's amazing. It's, you know, and, that, and that's what I say. It's just you, when we started going through, mm -hmm. and, and I think we found this a lot. You know, I remember this discussion kind of about how you know discovering what he had done, and and then also kind of rediscovering the Fox um, Fox film catalog, which was which was again I worked there. You know, with with uh, releasing stuff on home entertainment, and and they were kind of digging deeper and deeper into the back catalog into films like no one's ever heard of, it hasn't mm -hmm. been seen. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I kind of want to, one really good example, and, I, and, I, and part of this, and I think this would be a really interesting study, um, is just how um, some narrative, like, like with, with musicals, right? Like, remember the That's Entertainment uh, movies that M MGM put out in the 70s? Mm -hmm. And one, one thing is we, we st Fox started re-releasing a lot of their, their old musicals. And, uh, you know, I think the, the standard film history story is MGM was the musical studio. Mm -hmm. Starting back in the 30s, you've got on, you know, uh, Wizard of Oz and right up to, Gump, you know, uh, Singing in the Rain. And Gigi was the last musical, and that was the swan song. And we really haven't, you know, musicals. No one did bit musicals better. And uh, even, you know, when La La Land came out a few years ago, you know, the director said, you know, I wanted to make you know, something like an old MGM. It was wonderful MGM musicals. And so we started, uh, when we going through the book and we you know, started looking at the films, we're like, well, wait a second. Fox um, musicals are good. <laughs> <laughs> well, one, MG, I mean, you take away Wizard of Oz, MGM really wasn't making musicals. I mean, G the Judy Garland ones in the early 40s, but they were black and white, and they, they were really kind of were more teen, teen. I mean, Judy and Mickey were kind of teen, you know, idols. Um, and then we start looking at... and. Fox got into color. Oh, this was another one. Technicolor. Mm, yeah. mm -hmm. Zanuck uh, adopted Technicolor right out in 1936. Mm -hmm. uh, Ramona, the Loretta Young uh, mm -hmm. color movie. And then they started doing um, color musicals in 1939. And Fox put out, about, I think, about three, three or four color musicals. And I say color because back then Technicolor was expensive. You had to go rent the camera. You basically rented the camera from Technicolor. Uh, it was it was more expensive than doing black and white, mm -hmm. and uh, and you know Alice Fay and then Betty Grable and um, like they were doing three or four color musicals through the forties. MGM did not start doing color musicals really. I mean, yes, Wizard of Oz, but 
uh, till meet me in St. Louis. You know, there were there were a couple for you know here and there, but um, not until Arthur Freed came into into MGM uh, in the late '40s, and that's when you see the runs on TCM, mm -hmm. all these you know great MGM musicals, but they all date from the late '40s, early '50s, mm -hmm. and I I uh, I was like, Fox never gets credit for. For musicals, musicals. Mm -hmm. and then I, I came we came across this um, interview with uh, one of the, with the Andrews sisters. Uh, Fox was doing in the in the company um, newsletter from the the in the seventies. They they would interview old Fox people or you know for their little special interests. And one of the Andrews sisters, they were on, under contract over at Universal, and she said, "We would have done our last five films for free at Universal if they would have let us do one musical at Fox, you know, a big color musical." And I was like. Now, why did she say Fox instead of MGM? <laughs> and I started looking, and I pulled out the MGM, you know, the, the MGM storybook, and I pulled out the, and I just went through, and I said, you know, this is really weird. Fox did, you know, 20, 25 color musicals between 1939 and 1945. MGM did about, oh, two. And, uh, <laughs> and no one ever talks about these. And, that, and that's when we, and, and, and it kind of, it also came... You know, Betty Grable, who I think has just been forgotten, Alice Faye. Um, yeah, as a matter of fact, with, you know, and it kind of, it, it following the theme, Alice, of the not enough respect with William Fox, we kept finding, like you're saying, these people through the hundred years of Fox, it's like, well, how come they haven't gotten more due? Because you, you mentioned Betty Grable. We actually found she still holds the record after all these years as the number one box office star for a number of years, 13 years straight, top of the she, box. She, she was, well, she, she Nobody was, else has come near. Well, she was, I think that. she was on the, you know, that top 10 list. I think she yeah, was right. On, it was the, right. She was on, I think she hit number one once or twice, but she was on that top 10 list 13 for 13 years, years in a row. Nobody's, no female star has ever done that since. Wow. And Didn't we figured it was like Doris Day at six. Doris, Doris I mean, Day. It shows you how far back. You know. Go back it goes. And it was just, it was just really interesting because I think part of it is, 20th Century Fox has not, I mean, has not been a good promoter of their, like MGM, like I said, back in the 70s, they were doing, let's, that's entertainment. There was, there's been a very active MGM, you know, mm -hmm. let's celebrate our history campaign. Fox really hasn't done that. And, uh, and so that, that was kind of interesting for us to go back and kind of like, why is this happening? You know, what, like, like what, yeah. what, and I think, you know, part of it is the, you know, the studio, well, you know, it just it wasn't, wasn't a concern at the time. Mm -hmm. and whereas MGM, which, uh, you know TCM. I mean, and, and follow you follow the the you know media today. You know TCM bought the MGM catalog, mm -hmm. and then now they own, now they're part of Warner Brothers, and um, which also owns the RKO because Ted Turner had bought RKO and MGM, and now they own Warner Brothers. So so Turner Classic Movies has access to about half of the Hollywood classic Hollywood catalog. And naturally, that's what they're going to promote. You know, mm -hmm. we are we were happy a couple of years ago when they started showing because Fox phased out their Fox Movie Channel. Fox Movies started to be part of the TCM mm -hmm. airplay, but it was just interesting because I think there is an ex you know why do we all know the Wizard of Oz? Well, because it played on TV for fifty years. You know what I mean? We and, and there is an active promotion every anniversary. Wizard of Oz gets a you know, it it get, it get, it's, it really gets celebrated, <laughs> and I think that part of it is just if it's not in the public eye. Yeah. You, you know, things get, I mean, and there's so much media out there now anyway. But, I mean, it gets forgotten if, if it's not actively, yeah. you know, promoted. And that was something else mm -hmm. William Fox started. You could say it's the Fox musical. It wasn't it movie tone? Follies oh, of yeah, there was, or? yeah, the Fox movie tone. Or yeah, because they talked Green about Fox he got, like, the best Fox, people on yeah. Broadway to do that music. I thought, yeah. see, right from the beginning. There right, it is. Right, Starting right. at the best. Yeah, and there was Happy Days, right? Was right. That? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I thought that Betty Grable might even be in. She's in one of those. Is she? 1929. Yeah, you oh, think, oh, you always think of her later on. Yeah. But yeah. one of the things oh, I say in the book about her is I say, talk about perseverance. She was on that lot around 1929, didn't become a star until 1941. Mm -hmm. So talk about, and because one of the fun things to see her in when you think, oh, she doesn't go back that far, is Cavalcade, which is Fox's first Best Picture winner in oh, 1933. Right. Yeah. And if you look at the credits, literally on the film, and usually there aren't credits, Girl on a couch, way down at the bottom, <laughs> Betty Grable. <laughs> and you know, thankfully, because they've restored the movie, you know, uh, and it's on Blu-ray, and you watch it, you can see back, see back where that couch is, you can see Betty, <laughs> and it's about that far away. And there she is, and you totally recognize, you know, I mean, you know, earlier, but I thought, wow. So, I mean, there's somebody to talk about, who she, you know, you think, well, a few years and you give up, it's like she was there for years. So, yeah, wow, so wow, going back wow, to... Wow. Well, I'm curious, Jeff, I mean, 
are there undiscovered treasures in like films in the in the vault at Fox? Are there? Um, or have I, I they just, brought everything out? All the films? well, yeah. no, they haven't. They've not released everything. They um, the Fox film, the film, the actual film catalog. There's some interesting stories. Of course, there was a big um, so. New York, and th this is another thing that I, I think probably comes, you probably came, became very aware of in doing your book, mm -hmm. is really that, because we all think of the, the studios in Los Angeles, yeah, you know, because right. mm -hmm. that, that's where the movies were made, but m almost all the studios had, their, the head corporate offices were in New York, yeah. you know, and Fox, and, and this is, Fox himself, Fox would lived in New York, York. Yeah. Uh, and there was the Fox Studio on 59th Street, <coughs> 56, 56, 56, 56, 56, on 10th Avenue, uh -huh, on yeah. 10th Avenue, there was, wow. the, and that building was there. They kept that up till the 70s, early it's 70s. Still, but it's, it's still there. It's still there. It's, it's, a, high there. it's, it's a, a high school, high school now. now. But they and still have the cornerstone. Do they? And wow. in that cornerstone, supposedly, is something of a time capsule. You know, they had this. Oh, can we go dig it up? For the anniversary. Because, yeah, yeah, supposedly they put, you know, a lot of press materials on there. Oh, wow. There might be some. I mean, what if Cleopatra's in there? What oh, if, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, but, embarrassing. But there was. Yeah. Um, but so we had. So there was. You had New York with the corporate headquarters. You had the production out in California. And so a lot of material went back and forth. A lot of yeah. film. There was a huge storage facility in New Jersey. Little Ferry. Yeah. And there was a big fire in 1937. Yeah. Fox Law lost a lot of things. So that was about 22 years in the history of the company. A lot of stuff got lost in that fire. Um, also, after the silent era, you know, who wanted to watch silent movies, right? And they, they stopped uh, taking care of them. Uh, um, 1930, obviously, television, you know, no, people don't think about this, but really saved a lot of the, the sound films from the 30s and 40s because they were, I mean, if you go back and look at an old TV guy, you know, back in the early days when programming, it's like, from uh, 6 a.m. to about 7 p.m. every day was just old movies. And mm -hmm. I, I'm guessing, who, who grew up on old movies on, on, on TV, you know? Mm -hmm. that I mean, that's how most of us, right? Yeah. You, you, that's the late how, show. The late, late show, late, 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 late show. Yeah. And that's, uh, so, so those movies got well-preserved. It's silent, but, but sadly, like she was saying, mm -hmm. Theta Barra, I think they're Three of her film, two. But two from the there's the one from the mid twenties, which was made by somebody else. Oh, but there's a fool there was, which was her first movie in early nineteen fifteen, and that was what made her a huge star. And then there is East Lynn, East which, Lynn, in which she does not play a vamp character. She's a really interesting. Star. And th those are and the then, two surviving ones. Yeah, yeah. Does, wow. does, anybody, does everybody know who Theta Bear is? I, that's what. Mm -hmm. it, okay. Because yeah, Fox yeah, had the first sex that. symbol. Sex symbol, really. Yes, first yeah. Yeah. first yeah. cowboy star. And cowboy apparently, cowboy um, yeah. the the famous and we didn't put it in the book because I wanted a different. I wanted. Well, I wanted the I wanted the Cleopatra, but the the uh -huh. photo of her outstretched with her hands above her head and holding her hair. Oh, okay. Which is on which, the yeah. cover of the Eagle. Appar or, 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 yeah. or is it the, or is it the right. one? It's that one or the one where she's wearing the, the snake brassiere. Oh, right. yeah. Apparently is, is one of the most uh, reproduced silent film stills ever, which is, I think is really interesting. Mm -hmm. but, it, but anyway, so a lot of the catalog, especially the early Fox catalog, just doesn't exist. And we had... Mm. One, or is it known to exist? Because not known well, to exist. Say, that, that's a also, great way. Fox pioneered, he really helped pioneer the international distribution of the yes. movies. Mm. And so we don't know. We don't know out we there. We don't know. So we mm. hope remains. On a total, yeah, so. total, total side note, somebody showed me uh, up in Alaska, uh, and this oh, was a recent news story. Did you hear about this? The they Dawson were doing. City? Yes. Yeah. yeah. They, th there was, a, there was a, 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 a documentary about Dawson City. They were do up in, up in uh, Alaska. They were doing some excavating, <laughs> and they had dumped all this <laughs> film uh, <gasps> scraps, and, and it had gotten. And then they built over, and they were going in and excavating, and it just because it used to be the end of the film exchange line, they didn't know what else to do with it. They just dumped it in the ground, and they're finding all these scraps of silent film. Very exciting. It, 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 it's a wow. documentary that it's ran the it. Coldest preserved. Yeah, and, and it was and it was preserved in the in the in the permafrost. <laughs> Dawson City was a, a documentary on. I think it's on Netflix now. So anyway, look it up. But um, but a lot of the but uh, so a lot of the early stuff has disappeared. It, well, we don't know no known right. copies. It's That's a great Netflix way of saying okay. it. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, but um, you know, 1937 onward, I think Fox has at least something of. There was mm -hmm. nitrate film, which went out of production, which was the film stock that was used up until the early 1950s. Um, beautiful. If you ever, there, there are only a few places that it will show it. It, it is. It, it's it's highly flammable, um, which is why you know they switched to safety film, Kodak safety film. 
in the early 50s, what they did, because they thought this was going to be safer, they took all the nitrate film, they copied it onto safety film. The problem was the safety film, uh, it, which does burn too, people say it doesn't, but it does. Uh, it, it, the stock, it was very unstable. And so 20 years, and, and the, the genesis of the UCLA Film and Television Archive was the 20th Century Fox collection because uh, they transferred all their stuff and said, we don't want this nitrate, let's get rid of it. And so the professor at UCLA took his, the legend goes, took his V-dub van down to the docks at Fox, <laughs> took all these films, wow. Wow. took them back to UCLA, they Ooh. stored them. So the best copies of a lot of Fox films are up at uh -huh. UCLA, thank heavens. Uh -huh. um, because what happened with those safety film copies is they, they deteriorated, they were really bad and they deteriorated. So we go, when Fox does a restoration, well, a restoration or re-release, they will often, now it's very collaborative, so what they do is they'll, they'll contact lots of different archives and say who's got the best copy and they mm -hmm. they bring the elements together mm -hmm. and bring you know and give you a, the, the best that they have there was it but i think one of the film um one of the film storage facilities uh, up until 1980 was still in new jersey oh. and there's a really mm -hmm. sad story uh, i learned that the original negative for all about eve was there and for some reason fox yeah. decided to destroy it oh, and uh, luckily um the film curator at MoMA um, said, you know, that's my favorite film. Would you mind if I made a really nice mm -hmm. copy for MoMA? Because MoMA, very early on, back in the 30s, was a big uh, big proponent of film as a, as a new 20th century art me medium. And Fox said, yes, that's fine. So he took and made this gorgeous, gorgeous print of All About Eve. They destroyed the negative. I don't, I won't go, I'm, I'll, I'll refrain myself. Yeah. Uh, but, um, and, but that's the copy that was used for the, the Blu-ray because that's the best yes. existing yeah. copy. Wow. Yeah. So anyway, so as, as far as gems that came across, like I said, it was, it was fun for me uh, when, again, through my kind of work with home entertainment, a lot of um, the musicals were kind of fun. That was kind of fun to rediscover, you know, just kind of these. And, and you know, one fun discovery was the, the, the Fox Music Department. Again, I went back and I pulled out uh, the MGM, that's entertainment. And for all the songs that, that we think MGM, you know, all the great musicals, very Over the Rainbow, Last Time I Saw Paris, you know, Singing in the Rain, there, there's some, but, but you go back and look at the Fox musicals and um, songs like, uh, you know, Chattanooga Choo Choo, uh, the Glenn Miller, the Glenn Miller did both of his movies at Fox, um, At Last, uh, Harry Warren, Rediscovering Harry Warren. Does anyone, does anyone know who Harry Warren is? Mm -hmm. Look him up. Best, most most famous Hollywood music composer you've never heard of. All of his songs, uh, he was at Fox. Uh, you Make Me Feel So Young, um, There Will Never Be Another You. Um, uh, every, I mean, I just, it was almost every musical, Moon Over Miami. Um, he, like, a lot of his songs went on to be standards, but Betty didn't sing them because Zanuck said, you know, he wouldn't let her have a recording contract because he's like, I want you to come to the movie theater to see Betty. You're not going if, to, if, if you can hear her on records, oh. I'm not going to, you know, you, you're not going to come to see my, so she never became a big recording star, even though her husband was Harry James, who had, you know, one of the biggest bands in the 40s. So that was fun. Um, we also released a lot of the, what we call film noir movies now. And mm -hmm. uh, one, one, I'll just throw this out because that, this was, this is just, I, and I love the genre. Uh, there's a film called Cry of the City with Richard Conte, 1947. I had never heard of it. It is the most quintessential film noir you will ever see in your life. Um, it's got uh, Shelley Winters in a bit role. It's got uh, just, but it's it's a guy breaks out of prison. He bribes the nurse to get out of prison. <laughs> and it's this chase scene, and it's just it's just wonder. And I was like, why have I? Never heard of them. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just kind of, and so there, there, there are definitely some gems. Um, and we really tried in our book, we, we really kind of, we tried to highlight those that, you know, and kind of let people know about these, uh, some really, really fun movies that just, just don't know what no one ever hears about. You know, I mean, you hear about the big ones. Uh, but that was, that was, and there's some, I, and I feel like, like 1940s, Late 30s, early, you know, through the 40s, and Mike, uh, let me know. You. But even even the low budget, we talked about the Mr. Motos and the, the Charlie Chans and the, they, they were all B-unit pictures, the Sherlock Holmes. 
you watch them, the, the production qualities and the casting, and the, they don't look like B movies. And I think some of the other studios, you look at them, you're like, oh, it's definitely a B movie, you know? Yeah. And, and, but, but looking, going back at those, they're, they're beautifully done. And, uh, and now that they're finally available, you know, final on DVD, you can kind of get, um, you can, you can, you can kind of see them again. Um, yeah, I was, I was just going to say, I think that's something, too, you can trace back to William Fox, because his movies... You know, as, as, as much as he put into, like, sound or all his technologies, his movies always look beautiful. Warner, you know, like, Warner Brothers has always been, because they, were, for whatever reason, look, mm-hmm. never looked as nice as, like, an MGM movie. Mm-hmm. If you wanted a lavish-looking movie, MGM. Fox movies, and from the beginning, from William Fox forward, never looked cheap. You never yeah, looked at yeah. a Fox movie and said, well, that's the kind of movies they do. And what's nice is that carried right on with Daryl Zanuck, and that because that's what, what we always liked. It's a, it's kind of a nice mix between Warner Brothers and MGM. They all look all the Fox movies look as good as MGM movies, but they can be as edgy as a Warner Brothers movie. And you know, one of the reasons we just discovered that was is that Daryl Zanuck, who you know is famous from you know thirty five to the seventies, running that incredibly classic period of Fox, actually was head of production at Warner Brothers. So where we think of Warner Brothers and the, the gangster movies and the Busby Berkeley movies, um, James Cagney, Betty Davis, Daryl Zanuck brought all that mm-hmm. to Warner Brothers. Well, you kind of think, oh, it was the Warner Brothers or something. It's like, no, that was Zanuck. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's interesting. That, and then, so then when he goes to, to start 20th Century Fox, a lot of those traditions are come in. there. Oh, and, and one of the things I, I was thinking of earlier, too, as far as unsung is, uh, and you can talk about this, William Fox and the Newsreel. Because, of course, Fox oh, News is right, always right. around. Yeah, Fox News started in 1919. Um, Ooh, and, yeah, yeah and, and it lost money life. for a number of years, but Fox really believed in this. And he, he really just loved the movies, and he wanted to see them go into every phase of life. He wanted them to be used in education as well. And, um, and in churches and synagogues, he thought, you know, let's get the best preachers, and this can really sort of instill moral values in America. So he, he wanted them to infiltrate all aspects of American life. And then, yes, yeah, so a lot of early news events covered. And then uh, with Movie Tone, when Sam on Film came in, then he switched it over to the Fox Movie Tone. Mm-hmm. Um, we found it. We, it was always the best. I mean, you find any historian, they always say the Fox newsreel all those years was always the best. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. We found, I found a great photo one of the, with a big uh, billboard from 1920s, and it says... Uh-huh. Fox News, mightiest of all, you know, oh, and, yeah. and, I, and I just said, Fox, and, and yeah. you know, and, and a few years ago, one of the, the current Fox, because people don't, it's funny, and, and maybe it's good in some ways, but, uh, you know, Fox News of today, <laughs> it, 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 is, it is part of the Fox family, and people don't really put those two together a lot, but we had, there was a current Fox executive who came down and was trying to tie current Fox News to the Fox movie tone, and we're like, well, there was about a 25-year gap, you know, because yeah. you know, they stopped in the mid-60s, so there was, mm-hmm. um, but I just thought Fox, you know, I thought, oh, they'll, they'll, they'll get some play out of that. That's kind of a fun, you know, and it, and it was, but, you know, back then, it, it definitely, because it was Fox movie tone, and so the other, most of the studios had a newsreel, but but Fox went far and wide, and was yeah, a lot, yeah. I think the it was the most prestigious, one, and mo- the most sound, and, mm-hmm. and uh, they were, they, they were, the we had a little, yeah. I, we got, we found a little chart of where they were, and I put it in the book of, of the plate. I mean, they were, um, well, just Fox alone, but which, hence the, the newsreels mm-hmm. too, were, I mean, they were in India in 19, in the 20s. They, yeah. they had international offices all over the world. Very, I mean, we, you know, we yeah. think of being international as kind of a newer thing, but he was out there. He's like, we're, we're getting our films, uh, you yeah, know, all across well, the that, world. And that started do, you, do you want to talk about yeah, that a little that bit? Started, so the, I'd studios, like to the studio started in February of 1915, Fox Film. Um, and it's early, in, in early 1916, Fox went out. He sent, you know, two of his executives around the world for about a year, opening up these offices of, like, for foreign, uh, foreign distribution. And that was really difficult at that time, you know, getting money in and out and dealing with the ways that people use films in these different countries. The other studios didn't want to deal with that. So, but Fox knew, because 1916, what do we have going on in Europe? We have the war oh, going war. on. Right. <laughs> and previous to that time, Europe had really controlled, they'd made what were considered the best movies right. at that time. Germany, France, mm-hmm. England. They had to shut down because they needed a lot of the same materials that were used in the film industry were also used for munitions, for gunpowder. Um, 
for mm. making films. Uh, Make movies, not war, right? right? That's right, what you yeah. should be doing, right? <laughs> <laughs> but Fox, you know, again, you know, really seeing ahead and really like put, seeing really the basics of it is there, other countries are used to buying from Europe. Europe's not making anything. Let's move in and sell our product. Like, here's an opportunity, and this won't last, because that war is not going to last forever. And if you let this opportunity slide, they're going to just sweep back in and take the market back. So he went out very aggressively, first studio to open agencies, or to have agencies in his own name. Most of the other wow. studios would have some sort of partnership. Mm. So, yes, I mean, I, that was really astonishing to me, was to see how early... You know, the fact that in the late, in the mid to late teens, they were in places like the South Pacific, they were in Australia, they were in China, um, they like all, all yeah, over. All, Russia too, they were in, he, they didn't quite see the revolution or didn't understand. <laughs> that also was interesting. It was not just Fox, but the whole American business community thought the Russian revolution was going to be really good for American business. <laughs> They thought it's it's democracy. It's the last remaining monarchy In that's Europe. collapsing, mm -hmm. and now it's going to go democratic. And they thought it was going to be sort of like another version of the American Revolution. Yeah. Turned out a little differently. Call, call yeah. Shots yeah. on that one a little more. <laughs> but yeah, because yeah, that yeah. I mean, and now that's so such historic footage that that. That is Fox movie tone of the Romanoff family, including there's Anastasia wow. in footage, you know, because they went over there. And that's even on the DVD of Anastasia. They, they put that on as a little side thing. You know, you can say, oh, see the real family? Well, the only reason they've got that is that's Fox. Si well, probably silent then, I guess. Definitely yeah. silent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's Fox being over there, taking a picture of there's the whole family, you know, not too long before they were all killed. So, I mean, it's. Except it's like, Anastasia. Wow. She's buried in the archives. It's somewhere, somewhere there. Yeah. Just a fun, a fun side note: the, the uh -huh. office, the Fox office that they rented in the twenties when Fox went over there in uh -huh. London, is still the office building they're still is in. It really? Wow. And they, they wow. We had some visitors to the lot from the, the London office, yeah. and a few years ago, there was talk because I guess it's kind of a, I mean, it's like a, you know, three hundred year old building, and it's a yeah. little quirky and everything. But they they thought of moving, and then a lot of people there were like, "But this this has been Fox in London for almost eighty years," yeah. and they kind of you know there was this, and I I don't know if they ever did change, but it was just interesting. I was like, because I we really hadn't thought, oh yeah, you've been there, out, you've been you've been in that building longer than the Los Angeles studio has existed. So that's yeah, you know just kind of an interesting. That was 1916. That was it was very first, early, yeah, it was very one of early. The first countries so, that they went into because yeah, it was yeah. the safest one. Yeah. Obviously easy. Yeah. So, yeah. But, you know, like, some I know. I admire William Fox for that isn't generally known. There are certainly books on Daryl Zanuck, you know, who ran the... F and one of the things they praise him for is that he was involved in all phases of production and, you know, brought so much great talent to that lot that we talk about. But William Fox, in, you know, Meister, did the same thing. And that yeah, usually isn't yeah. something that comes up, uh, that he was very involved in the film. And certainly, we call it, the, you know, one of the, the, f the company's first big golden age of films was him pushing for quality and having that blast that became Sunrise, which yeah. many consider the greatest silent movie ever. You know, bringing, and like as you were yeah. talking about how Europe, he, bringing the best Murnau, of Europe to Fox. Yeah, yeah, he brought Murnau. Murnau yeah. to America. He really yeah. um, idolized the directors, writers and directors. He was not so much focused on the stars because he thought they just really implement the vision of the mm -hmm. writer and director, but especially the directors. So, who gets their start there? You know, John Ford with The Iron Horse yep. in 1924, Frank Borzaghi with yeah, those wonderful movies in the in the 20s, um, Seventh, Seventh Heaven, Heaven, Street Angel, and Lucky Star. Lucky Star, Star I really. love. I You've got to try and watch yeah. a, a Charles Farrell, Janet Gaynor movie, because that, that started, they, they were, because again, Eclipse kind of by MGM that you think of in the silent period, oh, it was Garbo and Gilbert, or who were the greatest silent teams? Actually, it yeah. was Janet Gaynor and William Farrell that had the Charles, longest, Charles, 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 had yeah. the longest career, both silent and into sound. Because usually most of them didn't make it. Didn't they make were it. Just as yeah, popular. they did, right. And they're right. good. I mean, they, yeah. Yeah, they're real. And Fox has them out. Are they only in the big expensive box? They're, yeah, they're in the, the <laughs> yeah, the, the Fox, Murnau, Borzaghi, and Fox with a big... If you're into silent film, buy it. Well, TCM yeah. will show them now. They'll show they'll show them now yeah. and then. But that was yeah. yeah, that was that was a big set. So yeah, yeah, because her career lasted until thirty 
well, the Star is Born, which Star wasn't, born, right. which wasn't Fox, but that was her la 1937. So she lasted almost a decade past the silent mm -hmm, mm -hmm. era, which mm -hmm. is pretty impressive for yeah. a lot of those stars. So. And at the first Academy Awards, you're know, speaking of the achieve the artistic achievement, which were held in 1929, I believe, celebrating films of 27 and 28. 28. Um, there were 12 awards given. Fox <laughs> Film takes five of them, and that was the what? most that any studio. And she was the first sure, best yeah. actress, yeah. best actress yeah, award. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you go, uh, you so can now, intriguing. you watch it on. If you watch uh, the Academy, has a lot of film clips on, and she in the, at the fiftieth anniversary, nineteen seventy eight, she presents the best actress uh, to mm. Jane. Is it was it Jane Fonda? Or, yeah, I think it was Jane Fonda. Oh, oh. It go, it's kind of it's kind of a fun because you she kind of disappears from Hollywood, yeah. you know, and then she shows back up in Bernadine in nineteen fifty seven, and then uh, and then, but you know she but she's been there kind of like Mary Pickford you know they disappear from the public view and then mm -hmm. she pops back up yeah. and you're like oh Janet's still around yeah. so yeah. Should, we, what, should we should we open up to questions yeah. I feel like we've That's been talking a, a lot yeah. Yeah. Then, <laughs> do you guys do you guys have any questions or, or thoughts or yeah I was, I was just curious how um, how because um, I, I was wondering if you were going to mention Murnau or not but oh, uh, mm -hmm. how did he how was it Fox himself that was that discovered his German movies and then brought him over? How did that, how did yeah. that transition happen? Um, Fox was especially impressed with The Last Lap. Um, he thought that was sort of the ideal movie because it used very few intertidal cards and he thought that's really the way that you should make a movie. Mm -hmm. And so he, he just, he, he personally brought Murnau over and gave him a contract and just, you know, and said, go make me a brilliant artistic movie. He didn't bother to mention that makes money, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so he gave her now um, carte blanche creatively and financially. And I think Murnau didn't really understand the American way of doing things. Yeah. So Sunrise wasn't a box office hit when it was out? It was, you know, it, it's really hard to figure that out uh -huh. because um, the studio kept saying it, it's doing really well, it's doing really well. But then a, one trade publication editor went and like sort of dug out the figures, talked <laughs> to people actually at the box office, and figured out they're making this up. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think it was not, I don't think it was a flop. Right. But I think it was not what it needed to be. I think the budget ended up being 1.2 million. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it just, it, it w didn't make no. enough to make it a hit. And Fox, for, for William Fox's point of view, I think he wanted a blockbuster. He wanted a Seventh Heaven mm -hmm. type mm -hmm. of movie, which you know cleaned up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was really those are like sort of tearjerkers, heart tuggy yeah. movies. And Sunrise is more of an intellectual, I would yeah. say, enterprise, mm -hmm. or more and more subtle emotionally. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I would so, have to yeah. say one thing. I think I tell people all the time is. You need to remember Hollywood is a business. Mm -hmm. They are there to make money. All this talk about artistic, you know, interest and making things artsy, whatever. The bottom line, if it if it doesn't make money, we're really not interested. And and that mm -hmm. and I think when people start thinking mm -hmm. that in, in that vein, you understand Hollywood a lot better. If it makes money, we're interested. If it doesn't, not so much. It can be a great, you know, it can be a wonderful little film, but if it's not bringing in money, we will, and and you'll watch people's careers. If they if they make films that make money, they continue making films. Mm -hmm. If they make films that don't make money, mm -hmm. they don't make films anymore. Mm -hmm. And so and I think that's that's an interesting. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah. it goes back all the way back to the twenties. And and mm -hmm. very early on, they were very very clear. You know, they were not going to be beholden to the playwright guild in New York because we are a crass commercial enterprise. We are just a factory. We just make things. We are not, you know, and, and that, that's kind of where that comes, that they just, if it makes me, that's interesting, because that's yeah, what we're but, now. But, but Fox always wanted to, but he always had these He wanted to, yes, yes, yeah. he, he did, yeah. he did, and it just, but the bottom line is, yeah. well, it didn't, you know, I mean, well, it, has it has to, to be, be both. it has to be it has both, to be I mean, both. ideally, yeah. it would be both, yeah. but it just doesn't always, And And that's yeah. not, it just, it, it's not just really sort of a lack of values or a lack of, um, you know, sort of, uh, I don't know, just a, a different set of values. It really was, for, for Fox's point of view, look, if we don't make money, the studio will not continue. Yeah. And then the, nobody has a job, and yeah. so mm -hmm. what's the point? So it has to make back its money. You know, yeah. you have to you have to make a, a movie on a budget that it's possible to get the money back yeah. from. Yeah. 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 And, so, and then the studio went through sort of an eclipse between around 1918 and the early 20s, 
because of changes in the industry altogether, studios beginning, other studios owning theaters, Fox couldn't get into the first run theater, so he couldn't make the sort of big movies that he'd been making, you know, things like Cleopatra or Les Miserables, which he made with William Farnham, or Tale of Two Cities. Those were, you know, big movies. Mm -hmm. So he had to, so again, going back to the importance of money, you know, you, you can't spend it if you can't make it back. Yeah. 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 So. Other questions? That's or? a great question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, just on that, oh, you got it. Oh, did you have this? I just wanted to know, if, um, huh? did you have a background in a lot of film, or did you watch a, a lot of the Fox yeah. films to do with um, I had been an entertainment industry journalist before oh, writing this for about uh, 15 years or so, so I had, you know, that sort of a background. And I watched as many of these as were available, but... <laughs> not a lot. Yeah, not, not mm, a lot. It's hard to find them. Yeah, it's hard to find them. And so then I would have to read about them, you know, from the from what was written in the trades and sort yeah. of for people's recollections of... of we we had a... In, in our book, we I found some pictures of the early, early lot in the 20s. And um, there were some sets there that I would love to identify at some point. Oh, but, <laughs> but the problem is, is the films don't exist, the mm -hmm. stills don't exist, mm -hmm. or, or we didn't have access to them. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of, I mean, and you're looking at these sets and they're gorgeous and, and really yeah. interesting. And I'm like, what? What was that? And it's just that, that 20s period, uh, you know, mm -hmm. stuff is just missing. And so it's, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's hard to do research when you don't, because everything's centered around these films, and the film doesn't exist. You know, you, you, don't, you can't find a copy, so it makes it hard to, to do research on yeah. without the documents. So. You know, an interesting challenge we found when you're, because yes, you got to watch yeah. the films, and like in our case, literally a hundred years of films, or, and literally we did. We, I, we saw. Um, We've seen a lot, was, of, all of, all of, seen a lot of Fox films. One thing I learned doing that is it's like, what? I need to be two people because I, I couldn't just have like Jeff or somebody else watch the movies and then tell me and then I'd write. I've got to watch them because it, there's multi-levels as a writer you're going to get out of it. I might pull a quote out of it that ends up heading a chapter. It might teach me better who that actor was or who that director was. So I, it was constantly driving me crazy. I thought, I don't have time to do both because I'm looking at a day and you thought, I could spend all day watching the movies and then I'm not getting anything written and then I feel like a loser at the end of the day because I didn't get anything written. So it, it was always like fighting with yourself. It's like, how do you do both? I mean, certainly Jeff and, and the rest of the team did watch too and, and hell. But I mean, when you're writing it, I just thought, I mean, you must have come across that too. It's, yeah, yeah. it's tough because it's like, I can't, Cheat! I got to watch, and but, you but do we have to watch. And we, fa and we found, and that was that was going back to kind of rediscovering things, because sometimes um, Mike would come across, you know, older critics who kind of just lambasted a certain film, mm -hmm. and then you know it was being re-released. So I would watch it as part of my job, and I'm like, mm -hmm. this is a great little film, and 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 Mike's, you know, somebody and somebody just kind of dismissed it as I'm trying to think of what, what were the. There was one, well, a lot there, of them. A lot of them. They just, you know, if you read the film history books, they've just dismissed. Well. <laughs> You know, uh, you know, Will Rogers movies. They were just a lot of you know silly, fuddy duddy jokes, or or you know Janet, you know whatever. And 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 I was and I was like, and it was in a couple of instances it was clear they had not watched the film. They were just kind of right. copying somebody else's. Yeah, I think you can always yeah. tell. You can you can usually tell. And that was so that was kind of like um, okay, that's that's unfortunate. You know, because it. it Summarily dismissing dismissing yeah. films that really were quite good, so. and that's why I mean Jeff and I were constantly calling each other and saying, "Oh my gosh, that's a good movie! Why did they always?" I mean, not only it was the films through the years for some reason film historians have picked on Fox films. It's the stars because at some point they decided MGM was the best and had the best stars, and Zanuck, well, he was a good writer, so his movies have good writing, but he didn't really know how to get. St he didn't really have a, a, the star quality that. MGM had, and that, that's just not true. Yeah. I mean, you got Tyrone Power, you got, and even some of the ones that people really wanted to put down, like a, a Jeannie Crane who, in the 50s. I mean, she did a Pinky. In 1949, she was the top star in the world. You know, and just had these whole, you know, did the original State Fair. I mean, really talented. You look at the people he had, and, and certainly once he came on, those stars proved themselves, because they, you know, that's what Fox, 20th Century Fox really took off. You know, and, and I think, again, that went back to the beginning with William Fox. Right, and, and the way that he's written, you know, what tends to be written is, oh, he just made a bunch of cheap, junky movies. Yeah, yeah. see, I heard yeah. that. I kept yeah. thinking, really? Yeah. Cheap? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. They don't, and then I looked back, you know, and those Theta Bear movies, they were just, like, cheap exploitation movies. 
Well, they weren't. They, they weren't. were. They were really based on right, and they were also based on like really high class work, like operas and well known novels. He always used really high pedigree source material. Material. Yeah. So you know, you think, oh, they're just sort of cheap pot boilers, and they weren't. Um, right. They but weren't. but I think it goes back to mm -hmm. just the films are not available, not right. a lot of documentation, right. mm -hmm. and then people just kind of start, you know, there become, becomes a stereotype and mm -hmm. or just kind of not, not taking that extra step back into research. And a good, I think a good lesson for any historian is you, 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 gotta, you gotta do a little digging. And yeah, find a little yeah, bit more. yeah. So, yeah, you, oh, yeah. Back, this is my last question. No, uh, you having, talk, maybe ask him maybe. Having, yeah. uh, having gone through, having done so much research, what would uh, each of you say is the lost film that you most wish you could oh, see? Okay, oh. that's a great question. I think we're all going to have the same one. Yeah. Um, oh. I don't know. Do um, like that, any that you were intrigued by that you saw like promotional posters? Many, for? many, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, for me, it would be either between the Theobatic Barra Cleopatra, Cleopatra definitely. or it would be from 1916, A Daughter of the Gods. That, that's yeah. the one I was going to yeah. say. Yeah. Tell, tell them about Daughter okay, of God. This sounds fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was, I have a whole chapter about that. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah, it was made in 1916. Fox thought, you know, everybody else is going out to California. Well, what do we want? We want warm weather, you know, tropical scenery. Let's go to Jamaica. Uh, why not? <laughs> wow. There's no film industry in Jamaica. <laughs> so he sends director Herbert Brennan, and this is like sort of an earlier instance of his adoration of directors that will subsequently be seen with Murnau, is he thought Brennan, Herbert Brennan was the greatest, and he says, just go make me a beautiful movie. You're a genius, you know. Um, I'll send you any money you want, go do whatever you want. So he, Herbert Brennan it, takes this movie down to Jamaica. It's a sort of Middle Eastern themed fantasy love story, and he's quickly overwhelmed. You know, that he has to deal with natives because the able bodied, or, uh, you know, sort of the, the educated population is British and it's all being sent off to war. It's in the process. Mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah. It, 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 you know, the natives steal the equipment. <laughs> um, <laughs> details, no, details. Yeah, there's no facilities there to, you know, where they have to start their own film processing lab to deal with all kinds of complications. And then there are these hurricanes or something oh, coming, yeah. and the sharks um, <laughs> that nobody land on, um, and alligators and things like that. So, but nonetheless, um, he. It, apparently was a really great movie. He, of course, he stayed far beyond what he should have. He and Fox started fighting. Um, so there's a lot of drama surrounding the, the making of it. But it was allegedly, according to Fox publicity, the first million dollar movie. Um, and even later on, it might not have been exactly that, but Herbert Brennan said, well, it was at least $800,000. <laughs> <laughs> it was getting up yeah, there. Yeah, it was, oh, yeah. Uh, that was a tremendous yeah. amount for the time. But that supposedly was... Um, a really and and it started. Movie. Do you yeah. want to talk about Annette Kellerman? Because oh it, right, right, she's fascinating. Yeah. She, this is interesting. Go ahead. Yeah, um, the star of the movie was Annette Kellerman, who was an Australian swimming star, and she had mm -hmm. kind of a vaudeville act, didn't she? I think a diving act, and she she did all her own stunts. So she did a dive that I think was 103 feet off this you know, cliff. <laughs> Um, she swam around in a pond with actual alligators, um, and she, she, you know, she was beaten up in a number of scenes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Looks strange. Don't well, you want to see but, that? I mean, I want to see it. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds fun, well, and it's fun because I mean, you guys, a, a lot of you may know her if you've seen Esther Williams' Million Dollar Mermaid. Right, that's because yeah. right. that is Annette Kellerman's yeah. story. MGM eyes. No. But that's and it's funny because obviously, obviously Esther Williams kind of picked up that mantle. Not those aren't Fox films, mm -hmm. the Esther Williams. Mm -hmm. But it's just fun if you because that's pretty accessible to see Million Dollar Mermaid. That's Annette Kellerman's. I kind of hope that movie would be more accurate and actually mention Fox when they're when she goes into <laughs> oh. making movies, but they don't. And of course, why would a rival studio mention? Yeah. But, yeah. but it, it's it's just fun and a connection. People go, oh, Esther Williams and yeah. Annette Kellerman. So, what movie would you choose? That's, that's my I answer. would probably pick. Cleopatra, or I'd have to check with Jeff if any of the Janet Gaynor, Charles Farrell movies are lost. It'd be that mm -hmm. one. But yeah, the, the, the Clare of the Gods. And, and particularly because of Cleopatra's later uh, connection with the, the infamous 60s one. 
Mm. You know, because yeah, that definitely was one of the reasons they made it. Is because that and, one was. And we so should. Yeah, and we should. And we should. One of the reasons we did the book, and we'll just get rid of this, ah, this, this myth and legend. Cleopatra. Clear up is Cleopatra was not the reason they sold the backlot at 20th Century Fox, <laughs> which, uh, see, which you, you will see. You will that that has been repeated over and over, and over again. <laughs> it, it it's coincidental, but the the decision Cleopatra, the decision um, to make the movie went like. Or, I mean, sorry, the, the decision to sell the back lot was announced in 1958, it was, I think it was January 1958, got the dates, uh, and Cleopatra didn't even, they didn't even start discussing production until 1959. The sale was already, they, they had, I think they talked about it at the board, the meeting of the board uh, in 1957. But if you lived in Los Angeles at the time, the, 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 what, the, it's the timing that was coincidental that made everybody think in Los Angeles mm -hmm. that this happened. Cleopatra goes into production, 1959, 1960. Um, the sale had already been effectuated. They started tearing down the back lot in April of 1961. Um, Cleopatra, the, the Burton, Liz Taylor, Richard Burton, uh, love affair scandal, whatever, becomes the biggest news story of 61 and 62. I mean, apparently it was covered by the media more than Created anything. the Italian paparazzi. Basically. <laughs> And they started building the mall in, in 1962. It opened up. And then Cleopatra opens in 63. And the back lot's gone. So it just, if, if you lived in Los Angeles, you were just like, oh, you know, this is costing a lot of money. Oh, they're tearing down the back lot. Oh, it's Cleopatra. You know. Well, and literally some of the players, this is why you can't even trust people who were there. Some of the players, like, I think it's David Brown, said that. Yeah, some of the, the head in of the documentary. The, the, he vice president, like, he said no, that. He's no, like, no. David, you were. <laughs> but it's because it makes a good story. It, it, and that's Hollywood yeah, and, and it's Ballyhoo. But it, it just shows you how hard it is for us as researchers. Yeah, yeah. You can't either always go with a newspaper says, you can't always go by what but, Publicity is publicity, and don't, <laughs> don't, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story, you know, as they say. But I, I did want to say, just as far as expense, because this came out, um, Fox restored Cleopatra a couple of, for the 50th anniversary, so that's about four or five years now. Um, and uh, they, in, in, with adjusted for inflation, Cleopatra and, and maybe Avatar might have eclipsed this, but <laughs> it was four hundred million dollars when they did the estimates a few years ago. Sure. In comparison, Titanic, nineteen ninety seven, cost two hundred million dollars. Yeah. So, wow. also Cleo Fox, also <laughs> Fox, Cleopatra, and like I said, it might it might have just if, if Avatar broke that or if you know whatever. I don't think so. But for over half a century, that hold, held and may still hold the record for the most expensive movie ever made in Hollywood. <laughs> And it took them, uh, ni by 1970, th through, um, it, it ran, by the way, and, and some people also, and again, talk about Cleopatra being a flop, it didn't do very well. It ran first run in a, you know, in first run in one of the uh, theaters in downtown Hollywood for a year. It was not, it was not a, the thing is, it, it just, it cost so much. Mm -hmm. It wasn't going to make back its production budget. But they, they finally, they aired it on, they licensed it, I think, to ABC. It ran on TV, and by 1970, they have, in, in seven years, they have recouped their cost. But anyway, but I think it's just an interesting thing to think that that was the most expensive movie ever made twice the, the and, and Titanic was a huge budget. <laughs> you know, it's but, funny because Fox's own history haunted them because Cameron complained while he was making Titanic because all the press was after them too. This is going to be the biggest disaster, this movie, blah. and they literally, they, and, and it came up too, that's like, this is going to be worse than Cleopatra, and see, that just infuriated him. He says there was literally a, a Titanic watch in Variety every day saying, <laughs> ups and downs, and he'd say, stop it, stop it. And, and obviously that didn't happen. Well, and, but, but you know what they did, and that was, I think, the second time they'd done that, to ensure that it wasn't a flop, they sold domestic distribution rights to Paramount and kept the international rights, which they had done two years earlier. Paramount had sold Fox the rights for, for uh, shared the rights with Braveheart. They would do that, so it's kind of like this double insurance. So if it goes down, we all go down. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, so Titanic, which is totally a Fox product, if you buy it today in America, it has it's Paramount. put out by Paramount. If you buy it internationally, it's put out by Fox. So, but it's just it's it, but yeah, it's always an interesting. So anyway, more questions. Sorry, we we, we kind of start we get talking. So. Yes, did you no no. Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> you tricked us. Though, so. How many photo collections do you think you had from movies that we didn't have the negatives for, that you didn't have the film stock for, but you had the photo collection? 
we had the photos. So the the so the twentieth century Fox lot in West Los Angeles. Like she was saying, we originally when they moved to Los Angeles, they had they uh, rented the and I'm going to. Uh, Selig Studio, Studio up in, in, in Silver Silver Lake. It's on Glendale Avenue, okay. mm -hmm. which is in Silver Lake today. It was Edendale back in the, right, the right. day, which mm -hmm. is now only exists on the post office. We went and looked it up. We're like Edendale, no one's ever heard of Edendale, but it's really <laughs> Silver Lake. So it's it's just kind of north northwest of downtown Los Angeles. They were there for a couple of years, and then they moved to uh, Hollywood proper, which was uh, it was West just called the Western Street. Avenue Studio. Yeah. It was on Western yeah. Avenue and Sunset Boulevard. And they were there, um, that's where most of the silence were made. Um, and then they bought the property out in West Los Angeles where mm -hmm. there was nothing. There was Santa Monica on the coast. Mm -hmm. There's these huge tracts of empty land and that's where UCLA yeah. bought yeah. their land. And mm -hmm. that's where, because uh, they were still the old rancheros, the Spanish ranch. A lot of them mm -hmm. bought their land from heirs mm -hmm. of the yeah. Spanish rancheros, yeah. which is just, you know, it's like, well, that's not that far back. Yeah. And so they bought the 100 acres in 1923, and then they started developing, they started building a lot of backlot sets in 26. Mm -hmm. A lot of yeah. golf courses also were out there, and a lot of the country clubs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, so, and so but, but physical buildings in 1928 was when like the permanent buildings mm -hmm. started popping up. What was interesting about the photo collection is that starting at about night, we have photos that date from about the 1928-29 period moving forward. We don't have a lot of the pre- 1928 stuff. Wow. There used to be though, like in the UCLA collection. There, 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 there were photos of the bean field. Oh. Wow. But Ooh, when I never saw those. When, yeah, and I saw them, and I just never occurred to me. First of all, that they were going to move that information yes, back yeah. to at a certain point. The story I heard was that the studio got into a UCLA said, "Look, are you going to give these to us or not?" Yeah, well, you know. Well, it, yes, that was that was part. They. UCLA, because for a long time they had done, they, the, the Fox material was just there on deposit. So we were paying them a storage fee. And it, UCLA just said, either donate it to us or take it back. And that's what and and Fox took it back. They took it back, mm -hmm. yeah. Which, so I saw these things there, and I just never really thought that they would take it back. But oh, there were photos. And then shortly after it went back to the studio, I, I thought, oh, I'll go to UCLA and look at it again. And that's when I found out it's not there. It's not there. So I went over to the Fox, and I, the, I think they told me I was the first person who'd asked to see it after the oh, return. I'll bet. And I asked for that, and it wasn't there. <gasps> it wasn't there. Oh, so, there so things have gone. Things, yeah. I well, okay. and and we we've heard. Unfortunately, I you know you won't believe this, but uh -huh. sticky fingers over the years in yeah. movie archives is is, yeah. a, is a common problem. But we didn't have so there wasn't there wasn't a lot for the the pre nineteen twenty eight films. And my theory is that if it was filmed over at the Western Avenue lot. It probably was there. That that lot was torn down in the early 70s, and I think a lot of stuff got junked there. Mm -hmm. But if it was made at the West Los Angeles lot, mm -hmm. we had it. So we, so there there and there are lots so of 1929, you know, through the early 30s. There there are quite a few. We we have the photographs. Um, the most famous one is um, the Murnau film, for you, uh, the Four Devils, mm -hmm. which. Um, I, that's I you know I put that next to I, I would love to see that if we ever find that yeah. her now made three films the four devils was apparently very it was about uh, four orphaned acrobats that joined the circus and it apparently was a very well received and and I think a well well done film and um, we have we have a lot of, we have the production stills we have a complete set of stills we wow. have uh -huh. the script we have everything except we don't have the film and no one, and that's one I think I hope someday pops up somewhere yeah. because is that story true about um, the last the, the like one of the actresses in it like throwing it into the ocean or something? Have you heard that story? I heard like she had like the last negative of it and she threw it in the ocean. Or I, something like that? you know, that, now that you say yeah. that, I think I have heard some something <laughs> like that. And you know, I mean, again, it's Hollywood. You know, I mean, how, how much is true? Yeah. But th but that is but that one. So we we and in our. The Fox Murnau Borzaghi set. We we were able to do. We reconstruct. We did a one of the. We, there were two books included. We reconstructed that film with all the stills and the story. And so that you know. So so there's so there's examples like that. Um, and uh, I, I, just a little tidbit of early '30s. I think this is kind of fun. Just kind of the international side of Fox was in the early '30s. They would um, take a. They would get a story. And then they would uh, film it in different, uh, they would bring, 
keep the same sets, and then Fox brought in international actors oh, and right, actresses, right, yeah. oh. and they would film a different film in in a different language. So mm -hmm. no dubbing. Then, no cool. dubbing. So, yeah, so they diff totally different. So the that. really famous example is uh, John Wayne's first starring role, The Big Trail, and there is a German, a Spanish, Italian, at least Ooh. three different foreign language oh, versions that. that were filmed because we have the photographs. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they did a lot with the, uh, bringing in Mexican uh, actors and actresses and doing a Spanish version. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so you'll have these multiple versions. It's the same film, filmed with different actors. Uh, you know, fam Universal was famous for doing this. There's the Spanish Dracula, which is better. That a lot of people like, you know, better than the English Dracula. But um, so there, there are lots of examples. But I would say about circa 1929 moving forward the archive is pretty as far as pictures and stuff is, is fairly complete but there you know there are things missing you know through the years but so the first 15 years a little spotty but moving forward pretty we're fairly complete which is really pretty yeah uh, Vanda, you know you did so much research about uh, William yes. Fox and what he contributed to yeah. the industry, and then he got tossed out of uh, right. his company, or he lost the battle control of his company. Mm -hmm. What did your research show you, or what do you, you know that he would have done if he had been oh. able to keep control and oh, you know yeah. control yeah. the company? A, that's a really great question. What he was really talking about in the late twenties was moving into. Uh, well, first of all, he would have done. He would have um, worked more on grandeur, like grandeur. Mm -hmm. Grandeur the flopped wide screen. on widescreen, yeah. right. That, that disappeared within a couple of years because he was in a financial argument with the guy who took over from him who was kind of, who was crooked and mm -hmm. didn't want to deal with Fox anymore. So I think that's why Grandeur failed, but you could have had that earlier. Um, he was also working on color as well at mm -hmm. that time. I think he had plans for television as well, and you know he's the kind of guy who could have pushed that through. Oh, yeah. um, and instead, you wait until the late 1940s. Um, he was also really talking about moving, you know, getting movies, you know, as I mentioned before, into education, into medical school education as well, like filming operations, Whoa. getting a great surgeon, you know, and filming it to show other doctors here's how you do it. Um, and then through, you know, filming the sermons by the great religious leaders. So a, a lot of different things, and and I think he could all he would also have made not just like the movies themselves. He would have made many other really great works of art because when you look at what he did in the late twenties, you know these are just amazing movies. Like I mean, you know, Sunrise. Well, that didn't work out too well, but that shows you where his level of taste was. Um, and, and the, then he brought up people like John Ford. Yeah, I mean, that's right, where Ford right, really right. got started. You know, I mean, he had been at Universal, but it's the Iron Horse that really showed. Right, that what was he could his do. first big epic. That yeah. was, you know, nobody really believed in Ford until mm -hmm. the Iron Horse. And then True. Ford made, you know, other great movies, and he would have stayed. And I think they kicked John Ford out. They thought in the early '30s, the next regime, uh, he's he's too overpriced, <laughs> and they tossed him out. I think Frank Borzaghi as well, who directed the Charles oh, Farrell, yeah. um, Janet Gaynor. Yeah. His movies after that are not that. Not as, as they kind of, they kind of, yeah. You don't even know. Yeah, wow. it's just so I think, and I think that's because what he was doing was very close to what Fox's own, you know, sort of heart for film was of, was about. And so I think you had somebody who's a very sensitive and talented director, but he needed somebody who understood him and who would let him do those kinds of movies. And I think we would have gotten, a, say, a different set of movies out of him and more great movies along that line. So, I, and I think that's really, that's probably the most tragic aspect of Fox's story, I think is not, I mean, it's sad what happened to him as an individual, but what did we lose because he didn't, you know. And do you want to talk, because he lived, I don't think people know, until 1951, 52, 52. 52 yeah. and talk, maybe talk about his last 20 years outside, because Nobody the, knows that. Because yeah. he, he kind of, he, he leaves Fox, and then, he, and I think the really sad thing is, I think, like, at his funeral, like, no one came, right? Is that, is well, that, is that's, that their again, fault? that's like, yeah, it's like, they didn't come because they weren't invited. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a good reason not to yeah. come. In a, in a private <laughs> cemetery, and I think, you know, the family was just so, you know, again, heartbroken for him, look, you know, you didn't want him, you know, you can't mm -hmm. come and... You know, say homage, don't and, right, and you know, shed crocodile tears mm -hmm. at, at his grave. Right. Yeah, um, but it was sad. I think he fell apart psychologically in the mid 30s. He 
filed for personal bankruptcy and he was not bankrupt. And that's another thing that's written about him. He went bankrupt. Right. So he, and he went bankrupt because of sound or something mm -hmm. like that. Right. Or, or because he bought him. He wasn't bankrupt. Or that he was a crazy businessman, which he wasn't. He wasn't. He was a brilliant yeah, businessman. He was. Yeah, um, So, you know, he still had millions of dollars, but he was so heartbroken that I think this was his way of expressing the way that he felt psychologically and emotionally. You know, he's bankrupt. He lost what was, he lost his mission in life. So he bribed a federal judge, never mind that the judge solicited the bribe, because it was really good. <laughs> um, and then FBI's investigating federal judges, because a lot of them were crooked at the time. They uncover this story, and Fox confesses, you know, right off. He doesn't want his family to be hurt, and he doesn't want his friends to be hurt. And so he can, and the FBI apparently was saying, we're going to pull in your wife and daughter. No, okay, I'll confess. The judge and the bag man who collected the money were also charged, but as far as I can tell, they were so crooked. There were two trials. William Fox is a star witness, and I think they bribed the jury <laughs> and both times because it was a really good case. Um, wow. Fox goes to prison. Yeah. So. How long did he stand, spend in prison? Uh, five months. It was a year and a day sentence. Um, and really, he shouldn't have, according he, according to the arrangement he'd made, he really shouldn't have, he should have had a trial, but there was a bureaucratic snafu, and he didn't get a trial. He went to prison. So, so what did he do the last 15 years of his life then? Well, Mid-30s to the Yeah, 30. it was about 10 years, because he, he, he went to prison. He got out in 43, in the Ooh. spring of 43. And he died in uh, spring of 52, nice. just what, nine years. Um, and he, d he kept a very low profile. There was a brief period where he thought, I'll start another studio, mm -hmm. never went anywhere. He was old, he was sick, time had passed him by. He was another generation. Um, and so that never really came to fruition at all. And, and we, then he just, and then yeah. he died. We, we found one story, is this true? Uh, that he came back and visited the Los Angeles lot in the mid '30s and walked around and nobody recognized him. Is it? Did you ever come across that? I one? didn't. I came across a story where I think it would it would have been the mid '30s and he came back and he was and I have it in the book. It's about his second in command. He's you know and and what he was trying to do was there was all there were several lawsuits. They were suing him, he was countersuing them, and he was trying to get that settled, and he was trying to get back some money. Again, I think he was really just, um, he was really off balance psychologically. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, it was just, he was devastated. And so what he was asking for was unreasonable, um, and the new management, you know, wouldn't give it to him. But so I think he did go in Maybe there. that was, yeah, yeah, we, we, yeah. I think we, you came across yeah. that as an interesting Yeah, yeah. I know but also it's, it's plausible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I know also certainly to his credit when we come, we're coming yeah. across so much negative things about him that I had not known and we made sure uh, is wasn't he on once he was gone from the company a lot of people just been mad and left but didn't he either suggest or get on an advisory group that was part of the reason why he agreed to sell yeah you can we're gonna start an advice you can't be chairman of the board because the new guy wants to do that but you can still have an influence. You know, you, we're going to create this advisory board. We'll pay you half a million dollars a year to be on it. And you can still, you know, help us run the company. Well, there was like one meeting of this advisory oh. board. Mm -hmm. After a year, they cut off the salary. Oh. And that oh. was it, you know, oh. um, and oh. tossed him out. And Reorganization, sorry. Yeah. But oh. bear in mind, the company is like going right. downhill. Uh, the like minute he left. So quick. <laughs> yeah. It's I mean, just the, yeah, to the bottom. The, I mean, yeah. once he left, twenty Fox Company went to the bottom of all the studios yeah. in the red during the Depression. They were literally at the bottom, and you can literally chart it. The minute William Fox yeah. was gone, it all went down. Like you mentioned, the creative personnel just through the early thirties all started to disperse. Well, I mean, they you let could John see Wayne go. They wouldn't. They didn't want to give John Wayne <gasps> a twenty-five dollar a week raise. Oh, oh my God! God. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's yeah. Yeah, I mean, so that's the judgment that that was. And you and you watch those yeah. some of those movies from the early '30s. They're they're a little tawdry. I mean, they're yeah. they're a little creaky. I mean, they're 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 you can yeah. you can see that you know there there was there were some issues there. But. Yeah, yeah. No, it, I mean that's there what was nobody. Seen. I mean, the guy who took over was a utilities guy from Chicago. Oh. Right. Had never run a studio. Didn't know. Had right. never made movies. <laughs> So it was just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> he 
you were not the only one, but right. yeah, it was just, I think the morale just was you know, completely wrecked and they were stealing from the company. They, you know, this new guy was corrupt. And so you, you didn't have somebody who really loved the movies as you did with mm -hmm. Vox, who was a tough boss, mm -hmm. but he loved what he was doing. Yeah. And, and, and many people loved him. John Ford thought he was the greatest, you know. Mm -hmm. And John Ford and too many people were the greatest. Right, right, right. Because he, he liked Zanuck too, but I think there were very few. I think it was William yeah. Fox and Daryl Zanuck yeah. and just a few others. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, you know, for all the criticism, all that negative stuff about Fox, you know, Ford said he was a great gentleman. Um, and a number, Max Steiner, who composer, was one yeah. of the greatest, composer. you know, film composers of the 20th century, he's, he loved him. He thought, you know, he was just the greatest guy. And, because if he believed in somebody, he supported them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I think his his you know the true heart for film, you know, just really loving it. Yeah. So. Any other questions? Or questions. I, thought, I was going to say what time? Thank oh, we've we've held you over the noise of it. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you, Thank you so much for coming. that they've been discussing so if you'd like to get a book and get it signed they are available okay. we've, we've got more than what's on display <laughs> <laughs> thank you for coming I, we hope yeah, I appreciate it